the next few minutes are going to be about setting up the context. Context is something which is going to determine the quality of the course as well as our defining or you know uh, discovering our own roles for it. Um, simply put context would be there was a time when human beings lived from a context that earth was flat and at some point in time uh, that context changed and we actually started living in a spherical world. So all our actions were then consistent with this new paradigm or the new context. So we are going to create some of these uh, contexts over here so that the course can then find new home uh, and it will be shaped by the context. So I want to invite you to participation, your active participation. The course by the way um, has already started that is meant to be focus of our work together. So um, we are not focusing on sharing of knowledge and that may happen likely to happen, will happen. We are also not having the context be or the focus be that of how to have students pass their exams and you know students may pass their exams too. Uh, this is more of a fulfillment of a vision okay? and uh, what that vision is. Uh, so let me just read this out to you. It is from the vision. So um, this is a, there is a uh, committee that was set up by the Honorable Supreme Court and this is an excerpt of the vision that was created by the committee. So um, they acknowledge that while these um, contents of the syllabus for environmental studies, there will be gaps. So whatever they propose, they said there would be gaps between what is considered ideal and the present syllabus, what you probably see in blue on the text. And I think the most important part of that vision has been for me that the committee has attempted to minimize the gaps by intellectual and material inputs. The success of this course will however depend on the initiative and drive of the teachers and their students. So if it is not clear as of now who is the teacher we are talking about, it is the person who is sitting in your chair your chair, that person, that person, the teacher and the students are you know the people who would be in our classrooms and who we serve. So during the next 10 days uh, there will be a blend or there will be a transition uh, from you being a teacher and you being a student. So we will be in this whole space of teaching and learning and sometimes we will forget who is the teacher and who is the student uh, but that is the nature of the work that is going to happen. Okay, now this course in some sense was a requirement by the Honorable Supreme Court and the word requirement invariably tends to devolve into like you have to or like there was no choice or like somebody put a gun on my head, I have to do it because I do not have choice, ha ha ha. A lot of times education and degree certificates are also requirements for a job and Professor Fatak mentioned a little bit about what if the entire outlook was that of getting to the next level of our own evolution. So I am going to invite you to this course not so much because it is an honorable supreme court requirement but what it was actually important to life and I do not know breathing is also a requirement. So you will have to probably look to see whether not having a choice about breathing is related to as a requirement. So in that light we will look at this particular course. Not a problem, not a problem. So um, it has been in the news lately the National Green Tribunal has asked the University Grants Commission to regularly monitor the mandatory implementation of 6 month core modules. Now I say 6 month over here we have been doing it for 40 hours about 40, yeah, 40 hours a semester uh, equally divided between humanities and social sciences and uh, uh, Center for Environmental Science and Engineering. I don't know how you do it at uh, Amrita uh, Nikhil. So at some point in time when you come on, you should probably share that. Okay, so it there is definitely you know a legal aspect of this whole thing, but we're not going to want to spend more time on it. We just want to deal with it as something which is important for us, and we are going to be sharing it with our students. Now, 
I am sure most of you at some point in time have gone on to Google and said environmental studies UGC and up pops up this particular first um, in the search. Uh, it is actually the syllabus as well as a book and right on the same screen on the right hand side there is an online shopping opportunity. So, I said let me take a look at that as well and you actually have several books the font I have deliberately kept it as small because this is not an advertisement and uh, but I just want to let you know the most expensive book over there is 196 rupees. Um, so, there are books available and uh, one of the things that you might find we do in the next 10 days is are things that are not in any of these books. So, those books are already available have a great time we enjoyed these books as well and we continue to look to see uh, what is the next in terms of core, core syllabus development content development and you know I actually am committed that by the end of this exercise uh, all of us actually will be able to contribute to the next generation of these books and contents that are available whether it is hard bound books available as textbooks or whether they are available in the new modes that professor Fatak has just uh, shared about. So, here is the context that I have stood inside of to deliver this course for my students and I am just going to share these with you. Um, the, the students are actually leaders of tomorrow ok I am very black and white about that. So, the students are leaders of tomorrow they are the decision makers I also know that I only have about 6 hours during the during the entire semester the one time the only time I get to meet with these uh, students in their entire 4 year 5 year uh, course program over here 6 hours is all I have with them and I very upfront let them know that 6 hours I am not going to be able to turn them into experts in air quality I teach air quality. So, I tell them I said you know the best I will probably do is to introduce some of the biggest concerns that are there and some of the vocabulary that you may want to pick up. So, that when you pick up the newspaper tomorrow you actually can understand the nitty gritty and the technical details. I also use some of the research projects that we have been doing uh, I share with them what is it that we are doing uh, as a state of the art. Uh, which a lot of times may not necessarily be available in books. So, this is projects that are real time happening some of the data that are being brought in from the students who are working. Uh, so, you actually get to share live data uh, and you actually get to share live issues in uh, managing air quality and uh, I even at some point in time I will share a video with you not during the course, but I will give you access to it. Uh, where um, we had um, Sri Jairam Ramesh uh, come he was the minister of environment and forest at that time uh, where he had come in and uh, um, I even in wanted to inspire students to look into taking up politics. I do not see very many students take look at you know taking up politics, but why not inspire them into careers that actually are in the area of environmental protection and that is uh, you know uh, I think uh, it would be a great outcome if uh, this course can in put them in on that track or you know inspire them to get onto that track. Also just want to sh share with you that we are really not intending for this to be uh, you know 50 ways how to save the planet or you know how to be a good responsible citizen those are great and you know if you go to any bookstore or any library you will be able to find these books and I think you know everybody should take on these practices and uh, do that. So, uh, the focus is that we are not as much a consumer of this information, uh, but at the source of this knowledge uh, leading from the front and that is again uh, an opportunity for all of us to bring partnership to. I am going to request professor Partha Sarthi and from this point on for the next 4 slides we will do uh, Jugal Bandi. So, over to professor Partha Sarthi. Thank you. We have this uh, Speakmake International Convention going on, so there are a lot of very interesting and uh, uh, people with much greater expertise than us doing Jugal Bandis. So, this is a different kind of a Jugal Bandi. So, in the earlier slide, uh, Professor Sethi mentioned about the fact that this is not uh, an environment studies for dummies kind of course. 
it's not about 50 ways to increase awareness. Like you have this internet for dummies, C++ for dummies, Einstein for dummies and so on. This is not that kind of a course. Having said that, I think one of the things that we need to make explicit in our teaching is to explain the nature and purpose of this course. If it is not simply to spread awareness while acknowledging that that is one of the objectives, what are we trying to convey through this course? Because what happens is that these kinds of a course, it's very easy for people to think that what we are learning is common sense, even though we know that there is a lot of stupidity in the way in which we address the environment. So it seems very commonsensical that we have to do certain things when we relate to the environment and yet we find a lot of people with a lot of knowledge, a lot of skills, a lot of expertise do not always do the right thing, the commonsensical things when it comes to the environment. So we need to convey in many different ways and we all will find appropriate ways of doing this based on our own interaction with the students and our own individual areas of specialization. Somewhere we need to convey that environmental problems and issues are technical issues, that they require high levels of skill, knowledge and expertise. At the same time, we need to be aware of the fact that environmental problems cannot be resolved or addressed by environmental experts alone. And this is one of the things that Professor Fatak was trying to say, that we have these problems with the silo approach that we think engineering is to be done by certain people, policy will be addressed by others, politicians will make certain decisions and so on. So there is an inherent danger that environmental studies will become a specialization in itself and that most people in the world don't have to worry about environmental issues because others who have qualified in environmental studies will take care of it. That is not what we are trying to achieve. The entire objective of the Supreme Court judgment and of the UGC initiative here is to ensure that each of us irrespective of our own individual areas of specialization, we'll have to incorporate the environmental thinking so that whatever we do, whatever technologies we develop, whatever solutions we propose, whatever perspectives we, we offer, will have an environmental dimension to it. Okay? I'll hand it back to okay, Professor. Sure. Okay, good. So, um, the relationship with the students, you know, um, I don't know how to say it, but they are already leaders, okay? They are already responsible citizens. So if I have that handled for myself as a teacher, then the kinds of things that I would be wanting to provide and needing to provide would be very different than if there were people who were just interested in uh, passing an exam. So, for example, some of the things that emerge then if they are already leaders and if they are already responsible citizens is how can this course address their unanswered questions? As leaders, as people who are already responsible, I just want to share something with you. When I was a child and I once was, um, I used to think that, uh, pardon me for saying this, but I used to think and you know, it was a very powerful conviction that I had that all adults were idiots. And uh, the, the, the reason I really was that conviction had come to be for me was if human beings, if adults had any sense at all, why would there be war on the planet? So for me, you know, it was, hey, that for me is evidence that adults are idiots. But it was just a few years later that I became that adult. So now, what? The war, war still exists on planet. Um, do I have responsibility towards what humanity is headed towards? Yeah, absolutely. But the kind of questions that I need to ask now so that my son or generations to come will then look back to see what is the responsibility that you and I took on that actually made a difference. And I think the place to start with is that we are dealing with people, with students who are already leaders, who are already responsible citizens. And you know, I'm sure you've experienced this with your own children, with your own students, that a lot of times they are way ahead of us uh, in terms of the knowing and in terms of uh, the kinds of things that they can, to, can do 
uh, as long as we are not in the way. We have some great uh, youth festivals on our campus and uh, I think they are phenomenal, they are recognized world over and that has no involvement from us adults uh, and I think they can do such a great job because we are not interfering. So we really need to look to see where we have a parent role to play and where we have a mentor role to play, where we have a coaching role to play and the coaching for me comes from a place of you already have great players and our job is to make sure that they win okay and them winning would be our victory that's what the coach's job is to make sure that the players win and that's our job. So the questions that will then emerge for us is how can this course address their unanswered questions. This is a course which provides maybe the only opportunity to ask the questions in environmental protection and get resolved for oneself and then ultimately stepping up to be accountable for their respective towns and cities. So I will share about this a little later when I talk about the air quality module uh, but um, there are times when students do not submit an assignment and they have their reasons for not submitting it and their biggest concern is uh, whether I will penalize them for giving late submissions. Uh, I even have them submit assignments up to one day before the submission of the online grades and the reason for that is the kind of work that we are asking them to do they will never have another chance to, de to deal with it or be able to work with it. They I um, will share with that share about that a little more the kind of assignments that we have been giving which is kind of uh, opening up that leadership and opening up the stepping of accountability. If you are relating with them as leaders they show up very differently the kind of questions they ask are very different. So I just want to set that up as a context okay. Um, I think we go to the next slide and uh, over to Partha. Hi, I am back again. So while I agree with uh, Professor Sethi that students are leaders and are responsible citizens, we must not forget that, they forget that they are still students. So while as adults we make mistakes, we also learn from those mistakes. So the whole idea here is to ensure that students do not have to go through the same mistakes that we as adults have committed for several generations. So from that perspective it is possible that because environmental studies is a mandatory course which students have not chosen to do there can be certain problems. There can be a resistance. That resistance can be that this is not what I signed up for, this is not what I am paying for, why should I study this and therefore it is becomes it becomes our duty to sustain interest and to explain the logic behind <coughs> the introduction of this kind of a course. But resistance can also be from other perspectives and that is also important to generate leaders of tomorrow because this generation especially is interested in understanding the logic behind why they are asked to do certain things not like older generations which were happy to do whatever their adults told them to do right or wrong. Therefore it becomes very difficult for us but also more interesting for us to incorporate this into our teaching because students relate to engineering in particular ways, relate to technological solutions in particular ways, relate to their lifestyles in particular ways, it is not always easy to make them realize that some of these choices they have made come with problems. They may be very good and very interested in refrigeration and air conditioning but when they are told that these technologies also have implications for global warming it raises certain existential questions about who they are, their career choices, their own interest in their subjects and so on and that also creates resistance. But like Professor Fatak was saying in the morning earlier these also give us new opportunities for us to engage students of different kinds, diverse kinds of students with different kinds of skills. So environment studies particularly offers opportunities to uh, ensure that students with different kinds of capabilities discover what those capabilities are and build upon them. So in my own classes for example I have found students with backlog, students who have failed and so on do remarkably well in environmental studies because these students maybe had language problems, maybe came from villages, small towns with poor educational backgrounds but they had a consciousness of environmental issues and they were able to do better. Other students maybe were very good at rote learning and memorizing and writing exams 
But when it came to reflecting on environmental issues vis-a-vis -vis their own areas of specialization, we found them lacking. Okay? So, projecting environmental studies as a blend of science, engineering, policy and social, cultural, economic impacts, that requires a certain kind of imagination. And it is important that we do not simply preach because that can create resistance. It is important that we do not just give them a glimpse of controversial issues without telling them how to address these controversies. So these are all quite difficult challenges for us and in the next uh, few days we hope to give you a glimpse of how we tackle these challenges in our classrooms. If this was not a required course, would the students take it? Okay, and how much would they pay? By the way, I think most of the time we do pay for courses. Okay, but there are courses that are required courses and there are courses that are electives. So this is a required course and you know, if this was to be turned into an ele elective course, is it a popular enough course? Is it an important enough course for people to actually register for it and pay for it? Okay, that's a question. And I extended it then to say, if you were not required to teach it, each one of us has our own favorite subjects, and if it is not a required subject, would you teach it? If you were not required to teach it, would you prefer to hand it over to someone else? And of course, the more difficult question, would you pay to teach this course? And of course, we gave an example of the professor at Cornell. Okay. So we're going to do now some notebook work, and uh, it's a little difficult exercise, okay? And I do this with my students in the class, um, and I invite you to look to see, generate value for it, of it for yourself, and see how that works. So the exercise is this. In your notebooks, create a context that would have you be at the source of teaching this course, even if you had to pay for it. So the hint for this assignment is that this is not for you. It is more for your children and grandchildren who will be grateful for you having done this notebook work. Okay? So I'm going to give about eight minutes for you to do this exercise in your notebook. Eight minutes starting now. Please go ahead and start doing the work of creating a context that would have you be at the source of teaching this course, even if you had to pay for it. Please go ahead. Move. Okay, let's move on. So, thank you for your work. And, you know, it's a difficult exercise, okay? And if the context is not sorted out fully, and it's quite likely, because eight minutes is not sufficient. So, uh, please use the next... 10 days or so to get this sorted out for yourself, okay? All right, I'll move on to the next slide. So I'm now inviting you to invent your stakes in this game, okay? It's an invitation. It's an invitation in which you can say yes or no. Let's get specific, okay? There are about 7.4 billion people on this planet. And this group of 4,200 teachers right now on this course make up the 0.00006% to educate the youth of India. If, let's get more specific, okay? The person who's sitting in your chair is the only one, the only one, the only one. Oh, let me go backwards. The person who is sitting in your chair, your chair, the person, oh, the person who is sitting in your chair is the only one out of the 7.4 billion with that opportunity for your college, okay? So I think you should be convinced by now, maybe I should not continue, okay? And a lot of times I will ask you this question because I don't know when to stop if you're already convinced then I should stop, otherwise, you know, I could go on and on, all right? So I want to thank you for your participation in this course. A lot of times this would come at the end of the course. I'm thanking you right now because you don't know what's coming up next. So you're a pretty courageous, daring lot. So welcome, 
and I thank you for participating in this course. We are honored to be spending this time with you. We are honored that we will be working together to lay the foundations for our relationship with each other for this huge national effort. There will be some assignments at the end of this 10-day training, and one of them will be to create a vision for the youth of tomorrow caring for the environment as a matter of personal choice they make. And then you would create a roadmap how, how you would contribute to the fulfillment of this vision. Okay? All right. So let me just tell you what our intentions are. Our intention, number one, is that for every hour in this training course, you would save about 10 hours of work in preparation of your lectures. Our intention is also to celebrate our working together and set up a relationship for engagement nationally for the next five years. So we would actually then put together databases of resources which would have journal papers, books, videos, and other resources. We are hoping that we will go multilingual on this. Uh, Professor Kanan Modgalya said 22 languages. You know, we should look to see how we can take it up, take this work that we're doing to multiple languages. And then somewhere, I think there's nothing more inspiring than actually live projects which are in operation at local levels where colleges are the driving force. Okay, people are always looking at educational institutes uh, to partner up and the energy of the young students to move things forward. So that is, that, you know, that, that is our intention over here. And I'd like to now open up the session to hear from you what your aspirations are, what your visions are, what your commitments are. And maybe even before you came on public, maybe it's a good idea for you to now again, because you were a little shy about it last time. So if you can go ahead and please spend a minute each with your partner in sharing what your aspirations are. And uh, let me just ask this question. Um, all right, now you know what the assignment is. Your assignment is to turn to your partner and share your aspirations, your commitments, and what would you like to get from this course. So turn to your partner, the person in the brown shirt. Okay, share with this person what are your aspirations for this course. Everybody, everybody turn to the person. Shake hands, very good. Now talk to each other. I love these people. And shake hands. Next year.